Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It is afternoon. It's just exactly noon, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Paul Helft. I'm the director of the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics, and welcome to our uh, uh, lecture series in clinical ethics, which we've been hosting for more than 10 years now. Um, you, if you wouldn't, uh, if you would make sure that you're signed in uh, outside the front door, that helps us to keep track of attendance, and you'll receive your continuing education information there. Um, food and drink are not allowed in this auditorium. Um, this lecture is being recorded and broadcasted today, and I just wanted to thank our colleagues who are joining us from IU Health Ball Memorial Hospital, Blackford, and then Child Life and Creative Art Therapies Department at the Peyton Manning's Children's Hospital at St. Vincent Hospital. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, reaching down and silencing all of your electronic devices, and if you need to use the phone, there are house phones just across uh, the foyer. So our speaker today has no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Adam Hayden. Adam is a graduate trained philosopher, writer, and speaker. In 2016, he was diagnosed with an aggressive and deadly form of brain cancer known as glioblastoma. Adam serves on the executive board for the nonprofit organization Our Brain Bank, a patient reported outcome data collection smartphone app for persons living with glioblastoma. He serves as an advisor for a patient and caregiver engagement group with the nonprofit National Brain Tumor Society, and he's a member of the Patient Centered Outcome Research Institute, grant funded nonprofit research collaborative, Brain Cancer Quality of Life Collaborative. Adam is also a consumer reviewer for the congressionally directed medical research programs, peer reviewed cancer research program. I'm not going to give you all of the acronyms for all of those. So Adam's research interests include most notably narrative ethics in medicine, and he's also interested in 20th century competing theories of carcinogenesis. Adam is married, has three young children, and he lives with his family in Indianapolis, Indiana. It's my great pleasure to introduce him and welcome him to give our lecture today. Thank you. There are several, several acronyms. So it's funny that we do that in the medical community. I'm going to position myself where I ought to be. I do like to cruise around a little bit while speaking, but I was told uh, for the benefit of the broadcast, I should stay planted around the podium. So feel free to, to you know, give me these signs if I go too far. Um, thank you so much uh, to the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics. Thanks to everybody who's here, everyone who's tuning in and, and, and watching the broadcast. Um, it just means a great deal uh, to me to have the opportunity uh, to share some of my experiences uh, with all of you. Um, there is a, a, a groundswell uh, happening within the patient community, uh, and it is that we are feeling the seat at the table being pulled out for us so we may join you uh, around the conference tables uh, with the administrators, with the clinicians, with the researchers, uh, that the patient voice is being lifted up. Uh, as a patient representative, uh, we're feeling that. Um, so uh, today's discussion will be focused on some of my research within narrative medicine and narrative identity, uh, and I'll provide some resources as we move along. Uh, but I, I first want to say just the opportunity to come and to discuss clinical ethics from the perspective of a person who's living with illness is a really special thing that we ought to acknowledge. Uh, it was not all that long ago uh, that you might be rounding on patients and you're having uh, maybe a sensitive conversation uh, with an attending uh, just barely out of earshot uh, of the patient. Uh, and I think that the trend that we're moving to is that actually participatory medicine is not talking about the patient in earshot, uh, but it's in fact uh, allowing the patient to join the conversation to take an active role in his or her care. So as we talk about narrative today, uh, really the backbone of this, of this conversation is supported by that uh, concept of participatory medicine. Uh, so I think you'll see that show up in Big Wheels. Uh, big wheels. Uh, that's I, uh, three boys, six, four, and two. <laughs> So the Freudian big wheels, I'm sure, comes out of that parenting experience. Uh, at any rate, uh, in big ways, uh, you, you'll see this uh, show up uh, in the discussion. So uh, here I am, and we're going to talk about physician-patient dynamics. I'm not sure that's the, the very best phrase, but uh, you know, I was, I was talking with actually uh, my, my dad about this, who's been a, a, a mentor and guide to me in my life, and I was saying, you know, 
uh, narrative medicine, uh, we just don't know exactly what that means. And even researchers within this space, and you'll hear some of this tension as we advance through the presentation. Some folks say, you know what, we really need a strong empirical backbone to the work that we do in narrative medicine. And other folks say, no, 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 we're not about empiricism, we're not about reductionism, but we're about something entirely different. And to produce narrative medicine down to these uh, just empirical data points does a disservice uh, to our research and does a disservice to the affected population. Um, so I've, I've selected physician-patient dynamics because that seems to make some sense to me in the context of this discussion. But know uh, that although there are a convergence of ideas, there isn't a consensus definition of narrative medicine. Some people call it narratology. Some people call it narrativity. Uh, but narrative is at the heart of all of these things. I myself, I'm a storyteller. Uh, so that's how I like to talk about myself. So maybe this is uh, a practice of narrative medicine here. Uh, but I think I'm going to tell you some stories. And, and hopefully we'll take some things away uh, through the storytelling. So uh, there I am. Um, I am not a clinical practitioner. Uh, I'm just uh, in some scrubs getting ready for, a, for an MRI uh, in this picture. Uh, but I look really professional. <laughs> so I mean, I don't know. I've got a clipboard and everything. Uh, that's just a, a consent to treat. Uh, on the on the on the clipboard. So uh, you know this is this is a, a case study, and it's a case study of me. Uh, so it is uh, sample size uh, n of one. <laughs> Here I am, uh, telling my story. Uh, so this is at the intersection of of many crossroads, uh, and it is uh, my formal training in philosophy that shows up in in big ways here. Uh, my own experience. Uh, of significant medical interventions, my diagnosis of glioblastoma with a rather grim prognosis, um, a, a lot of really personal conversations with close friends. Uh, some of those friends are, are here today. Uh, in fact, uh, you should be here next month uh, because my friend Emily Beckman is going to give a talk. Uh, um, there, I, I don't know if I should call everybody out by name, but anyway, uh, good friends that have shaped and guided this conversation throughout. Uh, but this is my story, uh, and this is what it's all about. These learning objectives, uh, perhaps if you saw the flyer, um, these, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's jargony, uh, but it, you know, it feels professional. Uh, <laughs> so here's what I wanted to do, is just identify what I, what I really think are the, the, the key themes uh, that I want to lift up. Um, illness, narrative, narrative identity. So we're going to see some divergent streams here. Uh, these, these divergent streams, in fact, will converge at the end, and the point of convergence is about improved patient outcomes. So everybody in this space is working towards the same thing, which is better care delivery for patients. Uh, but there are divergent streams. Uh, illness narrative and narrative identity, this is a responsibility uh, that a person who is going through an illness experience or living with disease, chronic or advanced illness, Narrative identity is about how that person makes sense of his or her life. Uh, so narrative identity, that's about the patient experience. Characteristics that are indicative of these illness narratives. Here's where we have uh, theory meeting practice in some ways. Uh, so I've been blogging for some time. I've been doing these, uh, these talks or lectures uh, or stele storytelling uh, for some time. And I was, in fact, doing it informed by just my experience. Uh, and of course, that background training, philosophy, and things did show up and influence me. Um, but I was, I, was, I was giving talks in rooms like this. I was at Marion University, their College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, and I, I was giving a talk very similar to this one today. Uh, and a student came up to me at the end of that discussion and said, have you ever heard of this person, Rita Sharon? And admittedly, at that point, I had not heard of that person. And I said, well, no. Uh, I'm sort of, you know, I'm getting schooled at my own lecture right now. Uh, it was not a, a, like an out loud q and It was a sidebar. So for that, I was grateful. I don't like to get embarrassed, you know. Don't ask me the stump the chump question. So have you heard of this Rita Sharon person? I said, well, no, I haven't heard of this person. And the student said to me, you really should look up her work. Uh, she's at Columbia University. In fact, she's the director of narrative medicine at, at Columbia University. Uh, and she has dedicated uh, her, her past several years of her career working in this space of, of narrative medicine. Um, and so she's the clinical side. 
Uh, but then there are also uh, these folks that are working on these illness narratives from the patient side. Uh, a psychiatrist, Jonathan Adler, will show up uh, during my discussion. So these two names, Adler and Sharon, that's who I want you to listen for because they're the people I've been reading uh, to shape this discussion. So narrative identity, that's the Adler space. Uh, there are characteristics that are indicative of these illness narratives. So when someone came up to me and said, have you heard of Rita Sharon? I said, well, gee, no. I started reading Rita Sharon's work. I learned a lot about what actually I was doing. So where theory meets practice, there was actually this whole theoretical apparatus. And my practice of storytelling fit right into that theory. And it's a, just a fascinating thing to do when, you, when you're reading about something that's happening and it applies to you and you didn't know it before reading it. It's like, whoa, uh, she's talking about stuff that I'm talking about. I didn't even know that she existed. Uh, so Adler, Jonathan Adler, characteristics indicative of illness narratives. Uh, Jonathan Adler talks a lot about the agency of the narrator, the agency of the storyteller. That in fact, what we'll see is that there are some positive health outcomes that are related to agency, a person's ability to act for him or herself or to see him or herself responsible uh, for the outcomes of their life, that agency is characteristic of these illness narratives. So the stories that I tell to you today will feature sort of me wrestling uh, with agency as I've been moving through my illness experience. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, clinical practice of narrative medicine. So if there are characteristics that we see in the patient storytelling experience, there are also uh, the clinical practice of narrative medicine, where the responsibility is on the clinician uh, to go some way towards establishing a therapeutic partnership with the patient. Uh, so those are the two divergent work streams, narrative uh, identity with the patient, narrative medicine with the clinician, distinguishing Ill illness narrative and narrative medicine. Uh, that was another one of my learning objectives for today, so that you know that there actually is a difference uh, between the two. So here's a, here's a great quote. Uh, the citation is small here, uh, but this is from one of Jonathan Adler's papers called Living Into the Story. Um, what does life mean to the person living it uh, is the quote that I pulled out. Uh, the PowerPoint uh, is, so you know, typically I'm not a PowerPoint person. Um, I just sort of, so here's my, I'm not allowed to move far from the podium, and, and I typically uh, don't use PowerPoints, but now I'm, I'm like sort of here and I've got a PowerPoint. Uh, so. <laughs> I'm rolling with it. Uh, so that's me. This is a couple of days uh, after uh, a, a craniotomy or a surgical resection of a 71 millimeter primary brain tumor uh, in my right parietal lobe, uh, which did lead to a diagnosis of glioblastoma, which is, um, so that is a, that's a grade four astrocytoma. I know perhaps all of our specialties aren't necessarily, I mean, I think astrocytoma should resonate with folks that have been or are in med school, uh, but this is, a, this is a malignant uh, brain cancer. In my parietal lobe, so the, the cane is helping to steady my balance uh, because uh, right parietal, so there's some, some uh, left deficits, sensory and motor. Uh, also, my proprioception is, is pretty terrible, uh, so, you know, if you see me stub my toe on, on the left side, it's because I'm not quite sure where I am all the time over there. What does life mean to the person living it? So I'm a couple of days out of brain surgery when this picture was taken uh, by my wife, who is my best friend and, and champion and, and currently is stuck in New Orleans because she can't get a flight out. They have like a light dusting of snow. I was like, <laughs> it's three here today, <laughs> three. I think she, she actually put up a Facebook post earlier that said she offered to the cab driver that she could drive to the airport. <laughs> he seemed a little uncertain about what he was doing. So uh, what does life mean to the person who is living it? I started journaling. Now, that's not a new practice for me. I've been writing for, for a long time, uh, you know, most of my entire life, in fact, which led me into uh, philosophy. Uh, for undergraduate and graduate studies. So uh, journaling, writing, uh, processing my thoughts through that medium, that's not a new thing for me, uh, but it's something uh, days after surgery that made me feel like me again. Uh, so as soon as I was able, I got out of the neuro ICU, uh, and this is in a recovery room at Methodist Hospital, and I, I asked uh, Whitney, I said, I really need my journal. And I started to jot down those memories, those experiences, as they were happening in real time. So what does life mean to the person living it? Well, for me, the ability to write 
to record my experiences, to process those experiences. That was quality of life for me. So that led to launching a blog and then beginning to do some speaking. So during orientation week for first year med students, uh, there is a, a panel um, that is uh, facilitated uh, by uh, Professor Hoffman Longton, uh, who we take first year med students, and there are physicians and patients on a panel, and we talk about asymmetries of power. We talk about communication. We talk about how does the patient look at things, and how does the physician look at things. Now, if you're in orientation week and you're a first year med student, uh, you may not be remembering specific details of this panel. Uh, I was told once um, that the problem with narrative medicine is if you try to teach that to a clinician, by the time residency hits, it'll all go out the window. Well, I disagree with that. And I think even if you don't recall the specific content, what exactly was said, there is a feeling that those students walk away from, from this panel. They get to witness the interaction. This is a clinician uh, all the way to your left. Uh, you'll see I'm, I'm uh, holding the microphone in the middle there in very much kind of a, a the voice singing competition way. I don't know. <laughs> Style points. But these first year med students are witnessing this interaction between a physician and patients. And that we are all in a row, it is a flat no hierarchy conversation, right? It's that everybody is able to voice their opinions. So just feeling that and experiencing that, if you walk away from that, not even knowing oh, what specifically did we discuss, if you had the feeling that look at this level playing field of folks that are on all sides of the healthcare table, uh, that's a good feeling to leave folks with. Uh, Lucy Kalanithi, um, who is the spouse of the late Paul Kalanithi, uh, you perhaps are familiar with the book, When Breath Becomes Air. Paul Kalanithi uh, wrote this book uh, as he was uh, actually a, a chief neurosurgical resident, was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Uh, he wrote this book as he was dying. In fact, Lucy wrote the epilogue to the book and saw that it was published after Paul's death. Uh, this book is just beautiful. And for any, just it's a must read. Uh, so that, I'm, that's, uh, that's not a financial disclosure. There's no kickback. Uh, but really, just you know, get out your phones and, and buy it on Amazon if you don't have it. What Lucy has been doing since Paul's passing is uh, she has been going to conferences, giving talks. Uh, I, I, I pull out a quote here from a TED Talk that Lucy gave, Lucy Kalanithi. So if you Google Lucy Kalanithi TED Talk, uh, you will find her TED Talk. Uh, it's 18 minutes long. Uh, so it's something that, you, that, again, I think if you want to read Paul's book, uh, you also uh, should watch Lucy's talk. Lucy says, what's really important, and this is why we want patients as part of the discussion, is that we understand the experience of illness, not only the technicalities. Uh, what we're really good about doing is teaching our clinicians the technicalities of disease. What is the disease experience? That's difficult to teach. That's something that you have to immerse yourself in what we're going to be talking about, which is narrative medicine. And it is a partnership. Uh, there is a, a clinician, a physician named Jay Baruch, uh, and, and this is uh, from an article that he wrote for Stat News. Um, this is uh, the, the context of a, a mother is on, on home hospice services. Her son is staying with her at the time. Uh, and she goes into respiratory arrest. The uh, son doesn't know what to do. In a panic, he calls 911. Uh, the advance directive and, and, and other paperwork cannot be found. Uh, the mother is brought into the emergency room. Uh, Dr. Baruch, who's an emergency room physician, uh, recalls this story. And he, and, he, and he doesn't know what to do. And that's the point of this Stat News article. Uh, there's some, some, I think, the, yes, the citation stuff is there. And here's what Jay says. I could have framed this discussion with her children differently. It's a discussion. It's a conversation. That's how we get to know each other. It's that right in a row, level playing field, flat, everybody's at the table. That's how we better understand the experience of disease for the person who's living with it. That's how the patient better understands uh, the, the tension uh, in the clinician's 
responsibility to establish a relationship with the patient, uh, to maintain objective distance, uh, to connect empathetically, uh, to use that empathetic connection effectively to deliver quality of care, but also not to cloud the objective lens. It is a great burden of responsibility that we place on our clinicians. Uh, so that it is this partnership that docs have to get what we're going through. We have to understand how difficult it can be for physicians. Um, I don't want to mix too many citation. Uh, I just read this, so it didn't show up in the PowerPoint. I just read this a day or so ago uh, that uh, sadly, the rate of physician suicides continues to increase. And what are we going to do about that? Uh, well, it's being explored uh, in, in some uh, stat news had a, had a piece on it. I think Washington Post uh, ran a piece on it. Uh, but it is a terrible burden that we place on clinicians uh, to have to figure out what is the middle ground uh, between empathy and objectivity. How do we give clinicians the skills uh, to handle that burden? Well, I've been telling my story in an effort, hopefully, to help us move this conversation forward. Uh, and I'm in a good position to do this because uh, I have glioblastoma with a really grim prognosis. Uh, so I'm not in front of you, uh, you know, with the flu, although it is bad this season. Uh, but I'm in front of you uh, with an incurable brain cancer. So I'm able to speak from that perspective. So that gives me uh, some credence and credibility uh, and window of insight uh, into the conversation. Um, I'm motivated to do my very best work now. Uh, I've said that in a lot of the lectures that I've given. Uh, I, am, I am highly, highly motivated uh, because with disease progression will come uh, loss of executive function. So uh, if I'm firing on most of my cylinders now, uh, then I want to do my best work today. So it converges on the idea that narratives are structured reconstructions of events. So I have been through it. Uh, my craniotomy was while I was awake. Uh, so an awake craniotomy is quite the experience. Um, I have reconstructed that as I talk about that experience. I find uh, my identity. Who is Adam? Who was pre-diagnosis Adam? Who is post-diagnosis Adam? Uh, is there a continuity of my identity through those experiences? Those are some of the questions we wrestle with uh, when we talk about narrative identity. So that Adler paper that I quoted earlier, there's another quote from that same uh, paper. So that's a, a, a fairly recent MRI scan. Um, now, I did have the caption, I need that like a hole in the head. <laughs> so the stories that I tell are me wrestling with my agency in light of all of these external variables. We do not have a cure for glioblastoma. We don't even have a cause for glioblastoma. So there are theories, but we just can't quite crack that nut. It is uh, one of the most um, heterogeneous tumors uh, that, that we're dealing with. It is a diffuse tumor. Um, you can't reset the whole thing, uh, it, it grows tentacles. Uh, so rarely will you have an encapsulated sphere uh, that a, a, a surgeon could go and resect, but you have this diffuse octopus tentacly looking thing. So there's the, uh, the, the a surgical cavity from the resection uh, of my uh, primary brain tumor. Um, it was a gross total resection, a 96% resection, which is significant. For those of you that know a little bit about uh, oncology or, or uh, about neurosurgery uh, more, more particularly, uh, or glioblastoma, uh, a gross total resection is a significant uh, positive prognostic indicator. Um, so just uh, thank you to my neurosurgical team for extending my life. Uh, it's incredible. So I've told this story before. So in the operating room, I am awake. I am responding to commands. Um, I'm watching the broadcast as it's taking place. Now, I want to watch it. Uh, the way that I have handled this experience uh, is by treating myself, in of one, treating myself as my own case study, my own intellectual fascination. Now, I don't know if that's courage or bravery or inspiration or, or, or inspiring to others. I've been told that that's the case. I think for me, it's, it's a coping mechanism. 
Uh, the way that I can get a little bit of space between me and my future uh, is to get really fascinated by what was happening. And uh, I saw that even in the operating room. Uh, in fact, you're allowed when you're uh, during a, an awake procedure, uh, you get to call out, well, not you personally, but on your behalf, uh, a nurse will call out to the waiting room and deliver a message to your family, and your family can send a message back. That happens on the hour. So uh, my message after the first hour uh, was, this is every bit as fascinating as I thought it would be. <laughs> so it really was. It was fascinating. Um, so I wanted to see the, the instrument-sized camera that was broadcasting what was happening. Um, and uh, you know, at one point, the doctor says, listen, Adam, you know, we've reached a point where I can be more aggressive. We can resect more tumor. It will come at the cost of damaging healthy tissue. So everything that's around that surgical cavity, the healthy tissue, um, the risk of damaging that tissue would be permanent left-sided paralysis. So right now, uh, not paralyzed. A little awkward. Um, I'm not sure that's as a result of surgery. I think that's always been there a little bit. But I didn't want to be paralyzed, so that, that, that sounded risky. But the alternative was that uh, we'll finish the procedure now knowing that we're leaving tumor in the margins of the surgical cavity. So it's like, well, rock in a hard place. Do you want to risk paralysis, but get as much tumor out as we can? Do you want to maintain most of your function a uh, little bit of deficit, most of your function, um, but knowing that we're going to leave a little bit of tumor in the margins of the surgical cavity. So I had been contacted uh, the day before surgery by uh, the chief OR nurse, and uh, Susan uh, is her name. And, and Susan, uh, it was her day off. So this, is, this just speaks to, to my respect of the, the, the clinical community. It was her day off, and she didn't call me and say, oh, I'm calling you on my day off. Uh, she called and said, I'm not in the office today. The number I'm calling you from is my personal cell number. Please call me back if you have any questions before the procedure tomorrow. That is generous and charitable uh, and, and just made me feel like, you know what? This is going to be OK, that we're going to figure this out, because I've got just a fabulous team of support behind me. So Susan walked me through about 40 minutes on the phone, said, here's going to be the procedure, and at some point, you may be asked to make a decision about how the course of the procedure goes. Um, and sure enough, I was faced with that. I said, when, the, when it came time to make that decision, I said, you know what? I don't want to be back in this operating room a year from now regretting the choice that I make today. I, I, I it was naive, right? I didn't know about, uh, you know, there are 140 different brain tumor types, which is staggering. I didn't realize that. I didn't even know that. Uh, I wouldn't have any reason to know that at the time. Um, of course, I didn't know uh, that then I would have one of the most aggressive uh, malignant forms of brain cancer. Didn't know that at the time. Couldn't have known that at the time. But what I said in that operating room is, I don't want to be back here in a year regretting this choice. And what uh, my neurosurgeon said to me was, you know what, you have to make a decision based on your quality of life today, where it is today. Not what it could be in the future. But where is your quality of life today? I've got three little kids. My youngest was eight months at the time of my diagnosis. So I had just a baby uh, at, at home uh, when this was happening. So I said, you know what? Uh, I love to chase after those kids, crawl around on the floor, play Thomas trains with them. Uh, permanent left-sided paralysis does not seem to be as compatible with running around with the kids uh, as I would like it to be for my quality of life. So I said, that's it. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna call it here. Uh, and, and sure enough, uh, that's, uh, that's what we're left with. My agency, right? My ability to make a decision, but not just roll the dice at them, but with that key insight of information, make a decision based on your quality of life today. So this is from that same Adler paper. We're coming back to it again. Agency is significantly correlated uh, with mental health in the predicted direction. That predicted direction is a positive mental health outcome. So here's where we see the empirical side of narrative medicine show up in big ways. Actually, narrative identity. I don't want to confuse them after I 
did such a <laughs> display of divergent. Um, so what Adler's doing is he's collecting uh, clinical data from folks who are seeking mental health treatment. He's uh, through process of interviews, through reflective writing, uh, through writing prompts. Uh, Adler is collecting data, then doing discourse analysis on that data. Uh, and he's feeding that into a computer modeling system. So this feels very scientific. This is the empirical side of narrative identity. And what Adler has found uh, is that, in fact, when people tell stories that feature their own agency, their own responsibility, that does correlate uh, with positive mental health outcomes. Uh, this is from an article uh, from the, the British Medical Journal. It's talking about patient expertise. This article is beyond the patient expert. Practitioners are encouraged to eschew paternalistic approaches. Uh, you can read it. So um, those paternalistic approaches, right, from a really good place, that, that we're the trained clinicians, and we know what's best for the patient, and we're going to make sure that the patient follows those orders. I was in a, a brain trauma unit after discharge from Methodist. Um, because of... Uh, swelling and fluid collection and, and other such things following surgery, which you would have inflammation in any part of the body, uh, regardless of where the injury or surgery takes place. The surgery is in my head, so uh, I did have swelling uh, of my brain, which uh, made me much worse off after surgery uh, than I am today. Um, now, thankfully, my neurosurgeon said, listen, you may be worse for the wear after surgery, uh, but you'll bounce back a little bit uh, uh, several days as we control the, the swelling. Uh, he did omit the part that I would be taking uh, heavy doses of dexamethasone, be really hungry, and get super puffy. Um, but that happens, too. Um, so at any rate, that paternalistic approach that we know what's best for the patient, my neurosurgeon was upfront with that. You're going to be worse for the wear when you come out of surgery. Don't let that discourage you. So I went to an inpatient rehab facility. Uh, I was coming out of the hospital in a wheelchair. Uh, I came out of the acute rehab facility uh, with a cane. Uh, and in fact, um, I was discharged uh, the Friday before uh, my little brother's wedding. Um, so as his best man, I was able to shuffle walk down the aisle to stand with him for his wedding. So that was quality of life, big way. So how do we, how do we get rid of that paternalistic approach? Here's a quote. Uh, the citation is the, at the bottom. This is from Rita Sharon, who I mentioned to you earlier, who I was ignorant of uh, over a year ago, uh, but uh, with whom I am now very familiar. In fact, uh, I think a highlight uh, of, of my experience over the past year is that I was able to deliver a talk similar to this one with Rita Sharon in the, in the audience, uh, which was uh, really, really, really cool. And I still, I get it like a little tear when I think about that, because uh, she's had such an impact on me and it was cool. So anyway, so this is a, a co-authored paper um, by two clinicians uh, who also do work in, in narrative. Uh, and among the most difficult tasks of medical education is teaching the nuances of effective empathetic interactions. Um, how do you teach the nuance of empathy? Some clinicians aren't even sure that we should teach empathy, that perhaps empathy will somehow be detrimental to the practice of medicine, uh, that you need to be distanced enough from your patient community uh, that you got to make the tough decisions. You got to do the, the hard calls, the tough calls. And if you have too much empathy, you won't be in a position to do that. Now, I tend to think that's rubbish. Um, but that is an idea that is in the clinical community. So how do you figure out how to move forward? Uh, well, this, if you can see the article title, Using Reflective Writing uh, to Teach Empathy. So there is a narrative medicine course at Columbia, uh, but at other campuses, and in fact, uh, Professor Emily Beckman, who's right there, has a narrative medicine seminar uh, that is for fourth-year medical students uh, on the cusp of residency. So they're getting great skills as they prepare for their journey into the clinical environment. Um, and the way that we teach them is that we tell them stuff like this. So this is from a, a doctor named Arthur Kleinman who has the concept of empathetic witnessing. And what is empathetic witnessing? Well, here's a, here's a nice quote. A commitment to be with the sick person. I may update that language to say with the, 
with the, 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 the person who is undergoing a change experience, that still feels a little bit jargony. With the, the, the person who is ill, that's a little bit better, at least we're leading with person first. To be with the sick person, to facilitate his or her building of an illness narrative. So now what's interesting is what have we, what have we seen so far? Well, we've looked at the work from Jonathan Adler, and we've seen that when a, when a person uh, in mental health settings, uh, but I think the case generalizes, uh, that when a person uh, is asked by prompt or reflective writing to tell a story about him or herself, the folks that tell those stories, putting themselves at the center, putting themselves at responsible for actions, speaking with agency, that those folks tend to have better health outcomes. Now we have Arthur Kleinman, a little bit more old school, but still says, be with the person. Facilitate their building of an illness narrative so that, in fact, the clinician can be with a patient, can encourage that agency, can encourage that responsibility. Adam, we've reached this point in the operation. How do we move forward now? So I think through reflective writing, I think by seeing ourselves as guides, uh, not as paternalistic figures of I know what's best, but as guides on the path towards positive health outcomes. So here's one of my guides uh, on, the, on the path towards my positive health outcome. Uh, this, is, I, I didn't, uh, this is not technically an IU Health Network doc. Uh, this is a hospitalist from Eskenazi. My wife has worked at Eskenazi for 10 years. And that's where I receive all of my primary care services and imaging and all sorts of stuff. Um, they don't have a neuro-oncologist on staff at Eskenazi, so I get referred out for that, which is great uh, because uh, my neuro-oncologist I like very, very much, um, who is affiliated uh, with IU Health and Goodman Campbell. I, I don't know. I feel like there's like a reverse HIPAA. HIPAA. I always feel weird when I talk about my clinicians, you know? <laughs> and I, you know, my wife will, will, will come home and she'll say, Today, the patient did such and such and such. You know, so we have this very like, guarded language, which I know is just by habit for her, and that I spend a lot of time in the healthcare space um, by that acronym-ridden introduction that you heard. I get the dialogue, but then I'll talk about doctors, and I feel like, I don't know. I feel like it should be a two-way street <laughs> of, of security and privacy protection and all of that. Uh, but this is, this is uh, uh, my primary care physician and my hospitalist, and uh, if and when my disease progresses, and I do require a hospitalization. Um, that's Dr. Lapitz, who's already familiar with my case. We've already activated the palliative care team at Eskenazi as well. So I have an integrative care team uh, of imaging folks, hospitalists, of palliative care physicians uh, who are familiar with my case and like sort of ready to go at the push of a button. So uh, I saw upcoming, I think in March, there's a compassionate care talk or something. So I'm a huge palliative care uh, advocate. I don't know if there's going to be uh, specifically linked. I don't want to speak to the content of that. Uh, before knowing it, um, but hey, uh, palliative care, uh, it's good. You can build bridges to hospice, but it isn't the same as hospice, so I know I'm, I'm preaching to the converted, but anyway. Um, so uh, there, uh, uh, Dr. Lapitz is, is uh, actually checking out one of my MRI scans, uh, is what he's doing there. Um, but thinking about uh, our electronic health record systems, um, those EHRs, uh, click the buttons and fill in the boxes and make sure you do this and did you ask about this and have you done this? Um, but you know, in fact, taking a history is a much more sophisticated and nuanced event uh, than we treat it. That it in fact is a very critical encounter in developing a therapeutic partnership with a patient. So uh, Dr. Lapitz, I think in that picture is just sort of emanating this enthusiasm. And who wouldn't want to go and like talk to that guy, right? That there is something that is just welcoming about that doctor. And thinking about, uh, you know, he's that happy and he's working on Epic. So there. <laughs> so if anybody is, I don't hope nobody's from Epic here. Get tomatoes thrown at me. But listen, it is, it is uh, to fit this traditional relationship built model of what it's like to care for someone, what it's like to develop an effective, empathetic relationship with someone, and then to translate that into modern healthcare using these EHR systems, that takes special skill. 
That is not something that just right out of residency, or for that matter, before residency, that you're just going to sort of roll up to the computer and know how to do it. Um, I, I, on Instagram, I made a joke recently. Um, are, are you all familiar with Doc McStuffin? Do you know this child character? So there's, there's a, a, a toy uh, with Doc McStuffin's likeness, uh, and it's a whole sort of clinical office visit set, and there's a, there's a computer there, and there's this just great commercial uh, where there's like a, a little, a live, you know, a little girl, and an actor, uh, and then there's this animated Doc McStuffin, and they're like charting on the computer, and I just love it. It's like, well, that's, I guess, you know, we start the education early. But, you know, symptoms, uh, I, I love this quote uh, from this article, and, and this is an, an article that I would, it's, it's, a, it's really, it's, it's a diff, difficult article to work through. Uh, so admittedly, it is, you've got to be sort of committed to the practice of narrative medicine, or at least have some interest there, to work your way through the article. So there's my disclosure on it. Uh, the citation stuff is down there. But this talks about the role of clinical records in narrative medicine. And I absolutely love this article. I, I actually shared it with Professor Beckman recently, and I said, hey, read this, because I want to talk to somebody about it, and my wife is over it, so I, <laughs> somebody's got to listen to me. Um, but the quote comes from that article, and it says, you know what? Uh, this reflects the other side. I said that Adler is about establishing a rigorous empirical backbone to narrative identity and narrative medicine, and this article comes from the opposite side that we are not going to get better healthcare through empiricism. That it's not about a positivistic approach, it's not about a data first approach, but it's something bigger than that. And it's about situating symptoms within, they don't even say a, a patient's context, uh, they actually develop this whole theoretical apparatus about a patient's life world. That it's more than just socioeconomic data points, it's more than just demographics, but in fact it's about close, close, close listening uh, to your folks, even when they're just giving a history, just giving a history, that that, in fact, is the first step in establishing a deep and lasting and meaningful therapeutic partnership between a clinician and a person who's receiving care. Would my surgeon have known to make me think about quality of life in the operating room if he had not known about my life circumstances? I told my neurosurgeon that I love to read, and I need to come out of surgery still reading. Now, I was too naive to understand about what would happen in surgery or placement of tumors and you know, eloquent functions of the brain. I just didn't have that information on hand at that time. But I just naively pleaded to my neurosurgeon, I just have to read and write on the other side of this. That's what was most important to me. Did that shape his direction in the operating room? I'd like to think that it did. Those therapeutic partnerships uh, start uh, by seeing each clinical encounter as an opportunity to, here's from Sharon, elicit, translate, and interpret a patient's story. That's at the heart of narrative medicine. Elicit, translate, interpret. What does that look like? Um, I, you know, Eskenazi is running commercials right now that I think Stephen is one of the patients who says, I'm Stephen and I'm more than my diabetes. You know what? That is the case. We are more than those things. Uh, and we live in a healthcare environment that is dominated by the system of reimbursement. Uh, that wherever I go, I am Hayden and my date of birth. I am Hayden 42282. When I pick up my meds, when I go for lab work, uh, when I go to get my MRIs, it is Last name, date of birth. Last name, date of birth. Now, I get it, right? That's important. Uh, that's as important as uh, if you have to have an amputation or something and you write the not this one on one arm and the this one on the other. I mean, that we need to be accurate, right? That we don't want to be imaging wrong parts of the body, that we don't want to be prescribing the wrong medications to the wrong people, uh, but we do reduce folks to last name, date of birth. And I think that this picture uh, of my doctor uh, encapsulates the quote that's beneath it, from another doctor, that we really need to think about our patients' stories, how those exhibit values, how those exhibit their quality of life, what is important to each person, ought to be important uh, in the way that we approach care delivery. So here are the things that we set out to do in the beginning of this talk. We wanted to define illness narrative and narrative identity. 
So narrative identity. So that's what I'm finding my way through right now, is I'm trying to figure out, OK, I have been through a significant change experience in my life that I went from full-time job, project manager in a corporate space, nine to five, growing family, owned our house, have gone from that to brain surgery, terminal cancer diagnosis, no longer working full time, can't drive because of seizures. How do I find myself on the other side of that? That isn't small potatoes, right? That is a big, significant thing. Now, thankfully, I've been given some wonderful resources. Uh, that is a, a, a solid family foundation. That is a social network of really good friends. Uh, that is just uh, my wife, who is my best friend, who's been there nonstop. That is excellent professors throughout uh, my, my higher education career who equipped me with some of these authors, other folks who I've discovered on my own. So that's out there, and that keeps me going. But narrative identity, how do you find the person in light of all of that crazy stuff? So what are some of those common characteristics? The big one we talked about, agency, right? Seeing yourself as responsible for your outcomes. And I think that that's what, I mean, that's what, right. What's the, what, what the word we have for it, right, is uh, a patient is non-compliant. Is it about compliance? You know, I use the, there's a, there's a device for folks with, with glioblastoma. It's produced by a company called NovoCure. The device is Optune. Uh, has anyone, you can nod or not nod or what, Optune, uh, they are electrodes uh, that you wear. You've got to shave your head, I mean, shave it, you know, to the scalp. You affix these electrodes. They have to be changed every two days. They emit alternating electric fields uh, through your brain. Uh, they disrupt uh, cellular division. They, they disrupt mitosis. Uh, and they have been shown in their phase three clinical trial uh, to provide uh, a therapeutic benefit. You've got to wear the thing at least 18 hours a day. So it is on you all the time. You have a three pound battery pack that is with you. You have to weigh that in light of the evidence that it does extend life. So an equipment tech comes out once a month, reads your device, and sees how in compliance you have been. Now, I was out of compliance a lot. And, you know, it, it frightened my children, to be candid. Uh, and something that I say, and, and, and now being cognizant that this is also broadcast and recorded, um, Optune uh, has shown therapeutic efficacy. It is an efficacious treatment for glioblastoma. We've not had a novel treatment for glioblastoma in 20 years since the approval of the chemotherapy drug timbozolamide back in the 90s with the establishment of the STOOP protocol, which is the current standard of care for glioblastoma. We have not had a new novel therapeutic mechanism since timbozolamide in the 90s. So uh, Optune, Novocure, is to be applauded for that effort. I am not talking down to that device, but it scared my kids, and I had to have a thing on my head for 20 hours a day, and I didn't like it. And I chose quality of life over treatment. So I was out of compliance, but for what I would argue was good reason. So it's all about effective, empathetic, therapeutic partnerships so that my doctors understood that that impact to my quality of life was worth saying, you know what, we're not going to do Optune anymore. That was a decision that I made uh, with the partnership of my family and with the support of my oncologist. So that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about when we're talking about these partnerships. I was supposed to recap the learning objectives, and I'm just telling more stories. <laughs> we're not out of time yet, though. We're all right. All right, so we talked about agency. We talked about responsible decision making on behalf of the person who's receiving care. The clinical practice of narrative medicine, so therapeutic partnerships. So here's a way that you could do that. This is what uh, doctors Dasgupta and uh, Sharon do in their, in their seminar, is they do reflective writing by prompts. One of those prompts is tell an illness experience from the perspective of a patient. So if you're thinking about how do I think more about how I might want to establish a therapeutic partnership with those under my care? If you're thinking about uh, an intern or a resident, um, a colleague, what is something we could do together? Could you make a commitment to one another to write 
a short reflective writing exercise. And then talk about it. So take it away, take the time, it doesn't have to be long, 500 words, something like that. Think through that experience from a patient's perspective or retell your own illness experience. Um, the Atlantic, uh, The Times, Washington Post, Stat News, uh, there is a growing trend of literature that is this physician turned patient uh, uh, literature. Uh, so you can, I, I love Stat News, so look at Stat News in their first opinion uh, section and you'll see a lot of this that I was a doctor for 20 years and then I had such and such happen and as a patient, I learned this about, uh, about the way that we practice medicine in my institution. So there's a growing body of evidence to support that actually there are clinicians that are learning things when they become patients. So uh, save yourself the trouble of becoming ill. Just sit down and think about from the perspective of this patient to whom I'm delivering care, what does it look like from their perspective? And then reflect on that. Something you could do. Uh, clinical practice of narrative medicine. I think we've, we've talked a lot about distinguishing illness narrative and narrative medicine as distinct practices, overlapping interests and stakeholders. Even though they are divergent practices, they converge on improved patient outcomes. That at the end of the day, although we're talking about theory, although that we are injecting medicine with the humanities right now, that doesn't mean that we're taking our eye off the ball of improving patient outcomes. In fact, I would argue just the opposite that we're going longer, further distance to improve patient outcomes when we incorporate the humanities into the practice of medicine that we are, after all, humans <laughs> before we are doctors. That's it. That's the talk. So that's narrative medicine from my perspective. <laughs> So if anybody has any questions, let me know and I'll bring the mic. Um, I'm Ann Hannon. I'm a longtime music therapist here at Riley, a 2015 fellow. And um, one of the most significant things that Paul Helft ever said to me is, you get this stuff because you're a therapist already. <laughs> and so I just wanna say I've been riveted during your presentation. This is so exciting. I've had the pleasure of getting to meet Dr. Beckman and all of the fabulous medical humanities teachers and present there. And um, I just, I wanna like start your fan club because <laughs> it sounds like you're the kind of person that could take this to the next level. And so um, you are having an amazing impact on on the connection between the humanity of patients and how all of us practice medicine. And I love that you gave practical examples and ways that we can change our own practice today. And so just to thank you for bringing this into all of our um, awareness and creating a space for us to have these conversations. And the last thing I'll say is that you made a comment about how maybe we shouldn't teach empathy, like that you've received this feedback. Maybe we shouldn't teach empathy because we have to have some distance from our patients to make the tough decisions. If we approach everything about health and well being with integrity, and honesty and come to the table, like you said, at the same level. There will be no one having to distance to make hard decisions because the person experiencing that illness narrative will have all the information he or she needs to make his or her own decisions. And I love your stuff about compliance and we're gonna have to talk sometime one-on-one -on -one because I could talk for like another hour. So thank you so much. So exciting to be introduced to what you're doing and this is just awesome and I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. That's generous, generous, generous feedback. Thank you. Adam, my name is Don Shutt. I am a staff chaplain here at Riley. Um, I'm aware that you made a comment about uh, taking a patient history and the correlation between uh, patient history and how that is done and um, uh, deepening the relationship, mm -hmm. something like yeah, that. Yeah. 
And I was sitting here thinking, okay, that works all through life. Not just how we listen to each other's narratives, how we ask each other our histories is the built is a primary building block of relationship in whatever realm we're functioning. Felt like a, uh, it felt like it just dropped down deep for me to hear you say that, as it specifically applies to our relationship uh, in the clinical setting. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joshua Scalin, a fourth year medical student, also taking Dr. Beckman's class here. Um, so I was actually kind of curious. So the first picture that you put up there, it was you and you looked very cheerful. And I was kind of wondering if we, you could walk us through your experiences following that, especially because you mentioned it was just prior to your MRI. And I was just hoping you could give us some insight on that. Sure, um, let's see. Uh, now I'm, I'm forgetting which, which, which first. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, yes. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. I needed that. Um, yeah, so that was, um, so the, the, the quick sort of up to that point, and then what was next. Um, so that, that uh, and, and I won't go on too long, but I'll start here and say it in a nutshell. So th this whole journey started the, the day after Christmas in 2014. Um, so just on the cusp of 2015. So just to kind of put that in, so, you know, uh, three years ago. So I had a seizure that day, uh, and I didn't know it was a seizure. Uh, it turns out it was a seizure. Um, so I, I had, it was not a convulsive, uh, I, didn't, I didn't lose consciousness, but my body just sort of crumpled down to the ground. And then that continued for actually 15 months, uh, and I was just managing it, um, like a lot of us do, right? I mean, they, I'd, I'd been to my, my doctor, and we tried to, you know, we, it, was it vertigo, is it stress, have you pinched a nerve, do you have a circulation problem? I mean, I saw physical therapy. We did a lot of stuff to try to get to the bottom of it. Uh, and all the while, those were getting worse and worse and worse. So uh, finally, 15 months of that, I had an episode that was so bad uh, that both my arm and leg were totally numb uh, and had la lasted longer than ever before. And I told my clinician, we have, it's not vertigo. Like, there's something really wonky here. Um, so I, I was uh, given a, an MRI that day. That was Friday the 13th, uh, May of 2016. Um, yeah, I know, Friday the 13th. Uh, so uh, at any rate, um, that's when they discovered the 71 millimeter brain tumor. And uh, then that stuff takes off super quick. So that scrub picture, I was uh, getting ready for a functional MRI. So they said, it looks like your tumor is really pressing on the somatosensory cortex or the postcentral gyrus. I don't know my neuroanatomy well enough to speak with confidence here. Um, but the uh, that was causing the seizures, also a slight left visual field cut because the optic nerve was being squeezed on its way back. Um, so that fMRI day, that was like, we're going to map your brain. We're going to see the, the where, you know, all the functional areas that are affected by the tumor. That's going to allow us to be really precise in the surgery. So I think that day was very much like, hey, do these motor and language tasks during this functional MRI. It's going to give us a good map of the brain, and then we're going to go in there and get that thing out. Um, so things felt optimistic that day. Um, I, I've been, listen, I've, I've been pretty optimistic throughout, so I don't think that that's, uh, I don't think that's incompatible with how I am today. Um, but after that, we did the awake craniotomy. I absolutely, that experience was, uh, it, it was moving to me, uh, which is maybe strange to say. There was, here's uh, one of the, uh, so uh, I can't get, the whole team, the whole neurosurgeon, the whole OR team, awesome. Um, the, the person who I think had this, the very best job or, or impacted me the most. There's a nurse, her name is Megan. Um, Megan's job was to hold my hand and to translate doctor orders to me and to hear my stuff and to feed it back to the doctors if need be. Megan sat with me the entire procedure and I can still feel that blue rubber latex glove, uh, that I, which I think is hilarious that it's like she had to wear a glove. <laughs> um, but that was, that was like, man, that set the tone for me that you know what, there are, we are humans journeying together through this. Uh, so there was surgery, uh, then there was inpatient acute rehab uh, for a few weeks, uh, then it's been outpatient rehab and chemo and radiation ever since then. Uh, but I've, I've tried to sort of, um, 
You know, I don't, we don't, we don't have long-term survivors with glioblastoma. Uh, you, you're, there are some unicorns that have like 13 years of survival. Uh, I've never let that get me down. I don't need 13 years, right? I just need until we get the next breakthrough. Um, and that could be tomorrow. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I volunteer with National Brain Tumor Society, because they fund glioblastoma research. So give them some money. <laughs> All right, I think we are right at one o'clock. So Adam, thank you so much for coming thank today. Um, thank you. We will be back at Methodist in just three weeks on February 7th with Emily Beckman. Thanks everyone. <laughs>